Hey everybody, what's happening? Welcome to smarthelping.com. This is the construction business financial model overview. <clears throat> I'm going to go through every assumption tab, explain how the assumptions work together, um, and we'll, we'll uh, explain it that way. Uh, the focus on the construction business model here was to be able to get a close forecast for cash flow requirements and scaling multiple construction jobs. Uh, first tab is global control. This is just where you can define the company name. That'll go on the uh, financial statements at the top. The launch year. Now this will drive all the drop downs. So make sure if you do change this, you make sure your drop downs on revenue. <clears throat> sorry, not revenue. On like the start month of these costs are making sense. The capex expenditures make sense, and the debt schedule start month. Other than that, there this doesn't have a huge impact um, the end month you can pick any month within 10 year uh, time frame to end the forecast whenever you end it that'll stop all operations and then you can also choose to include the terminal value or not and if you do it's just based on a trailing 12 month EBITDA multiple reason being is you want to just kind of cash flow analysis potentially for a full valuation and um, for that you want to get a value at the end month <clears throat> cash sources the only thing you're going to input here is if you're going to fund any of the initial costs with debt like traditional loan um, if so you can put that here and then any remaining cash required which would be any startup costs, any burn from operations for the first couple months or years, and um, CapEx would go into here. The amount that you get funded via investor funding or owner funding is separated, and that will be sourced on the cap table, so you're not going to put anything here. Uh, and then you could define if you're going to pay taxes or not in the model. If not, you can zero them out. If you do want to see tax effects, you can put them in here and sanity check on a global assumption so you can make sure all of your statements match up this should always be all zero so the main meat of this is the revenue assumptions and the way I separated it was you've got three different job types that you can configure and you're going to scale those out over time so what that means is over the course of up to 10 years by month you can define how many jobs you expect to start you can define the percentage of those of a given job that's completed over time. And this runs on the same monthly timeline here. So if you put, you know, in this case, it's saying you're completing roughly 5% a month and it takes you 20 months to complete a job that will apply dynamically to every um, job count started in each month. So like in month six, you have a job count of five here. If we go into the matrix for job type one, you can see my month six. This is starting in month six here. And that is the, well, in this case, that's wages. We've got uh, rental payments, and materials, when cash is collected, and revenue earned. So this is dynamic based on these percentages here the percentage of job completed will define when revenue is earned but you might collect cash differently so you can define the percentage of the cash of or the percentage of the amount you think your average job is going to be and when you collect that in this case I've just put 10% in month one and then the rest at the end which is after 20 months now this is arbitrary so you can go in and change these percentages to anything that whatever makes sense for your specific business. Uh, you can also define when you pay for materials and what the average cost of materials is. Uh, the construction cost details where you can define the materials cost and equipment costs, and this would be if you're renting. And what this model will have you do is for a given job, you want to just put in what you think you're going to pay for materials on average and rental. And that will be based on however many, you know, what the job entails. And I've done three job types, so you can have some granularity there. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, payroll taxes, uh, wages, all of that. You can define um, up to, for each job type, you can do up to 10 worker types. And then the head count of each, you can define their average overtime and regular hours worked per year to get a weighted average 
rate based on their regular rate and overtime rate. Uh, you could define the total hours per job here. And again, this is all configuring what it takes to complete a single job. So this is would be your average crew size, their wages, the average hours they work on a given job for. Now I did do a sanity check here. So this is to make sure what you're putting in makes sense. In this case, um, if there's 26 working days in a month and you're completing 5% of a given job each month and the total job's 1900 hours, this is saying on average per uh, month one through, and I think I did it up to 60 month job you can account for. Um, but 3.7 hours a day here, if you were to lower this to say 1,000 hours a job, this goes down. So here in this case, if worker type one only works 1,000 hours on a given job, over 20 months, they're doing 1.9 hours average per day. And this could be higher too, maybe it's 5,000. And they're doing about nine and a half hours a day. And this, again, these percentages will run off of percentage of job completed per month row. So this is going to be really important to understand, and it's the best way I can think of to scale where you've got multiple jobs starting over time and various payment terms that where you collect cash and also various um, time it takes to complete a given job. You know, it could be 100% if a job only takes one month or if it takes two months, it'd be 50-50. And you just want to make sure these uh, gray cells always add up to 100%. Now you see this is 125, so I put in an extra percent here, so I want to zero that out. I actually want to zero all of these out, because we have 100% up front in this case. So those should always equal 100%, or else you're going to be double counting uh, your numbers. Uh, that's how revenue is defined. Uh, we have other OPEX, so this would be to account for potentially... Um, Overhead, like legal fees, managers, anything that anybody that's a fixed uh, monthly price that's not working on the jobs for in, in this section, that's not included in this section. Um, you can put here, and these are split into three different cost sections. If you need it, you just define the start month, the monthly cost in each year. There's also a catch-all that runs off a, a percentage of total revenues which will flow right here off of F25, which is total revenue, and that's off revenue earned. Um, so that's OPEX cap table. Here's where you simply define, if you have any outside investors, you can define the total invested by each, the percentage of, uh, and I've just put everything to common shares here. So the, the minimum equity required defaults here, you can do, just type in arbitrary share amount, the percentage of common shares, which I put at 100, and then what your how much of this equity requirement is coming from each investor, the percentage they're getting of the company as a return, and then owners, same deal, any investments, and then percentage, and they could have zero investment. That's it, These are all arbitrary numbers that I have in here. You just wanna make sure these rows always add up to zero or if you're not using a column like the preferred A and B, it'll be negative 100. We've also got a internal rate of return calc for each individual investor row and in aggregate for operators and investors. CapEx, so this is gonna be if you're planning to buy your equipment instead of renting it and you just put in, you know, as long as the useful life and the month is the same, you can bulk buy these if you plan on buying tranches of equipment over time you can account for that here and that will just basically run um, that'll affect cash flow and depreciation expense which is automatically calculated based on these inputs uh, let's see never clear this column out even if you're not using it just zero out c and d but don't clear out f ever that schedule we already talked about where the finest amount is driven from on the global control tab but you have terms here of the loan and the start month that will drive this dynamically. Terminal values just to define on the exit if any of that extraordinary income is going to be applied to um, items on the CapEx table or not. If not, you can just put 100% here or some percentages you can put 
something less than 100%, the remaining amount will go to CapEx in to find uh, net gain or loss. Startup costs, these are just one-time costs that you might have um, before operations begin. It could be all kinds of different things, even account for a reserve if you want. And in, in that case, the model will solve for zero cash balance. But if you put a reserve in here, technically that's the amount you would have extra. <clears throat> Don't put capital assets on here um, because then they won't hit depreciation. Uh, you just want to put, you know, non um, capital asset purchase or, or spend that happens. Generally, the most of the time here would be just legal fees, uh, maybe setup fees, maybe um, like a web design or something. Depends on what the business is. Uh, next up, we have income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. So this is showing a monthly uh, view and an annual view. This is the monthly. So we just have our construction revenues based on when uh, the job is completed against how the value of each job. And that runs over time. You've got construction costs total. And this should be construction costs. Um, I looked at a couple income statements and they seem for construction companies, they seem to um, group all these together. So you've got your construction revenues, construction costs, you define growth profit as a function of that. You still have your other OPEX and then you've got EBITDA as a calculation of your revenues less all these different operating costs. You've also got interest and depreciation here. And uh, then we come down to taxable income and net income. So if you scroll down here, you can see there's some taxes. And then on the exit, if we do include terminal value, there's going to be some taxes there uh, that are a bit higher in that month. Income statement annual is the same deal, um, but on an annual basis. So you can see annual EBITDA, uh, net income, and this should always equal the monthly total. Now balance sheet, we've got two items here. We've got cash position, which is just going to be against all the different cash happenings that are going on. Um, this should solve for zero. So if we scroll over here, there it is. Um, you should see a zero somewhere in this row one time. Uh, again, that's what the model solves for. This row, receivables and unrecognized revenue, is how we reconcile collecting cash at different times from when work is completed. Now, you could technically have receivables, and then if it's a negative, it'd be a, a liability. And a negative simply means you've collected more cash than what work you've provided, i.e. if you're collecting more cash up front on the contracts and then providing the work later. This would be the amount you're o you owe of work to provide. So that's a liability if it's negative. But if it's a positive, it means it's a receivable, and that simply means you've done the work, but you haven't collected cash yet. And that dynamic will be defined based on this completion percentage you put in here, however many months it takes you to complete, um, or how much of a job you complete in each month, and the cash collection. So again, in this case, we're, we're doing 5% of the job a month for 20 months, and we're collecting 10% of the total 2.5 million up front, and then the rest we're collecting at the end uh, in month 20. And again, these are arbitrary. So you can set these percentages up to whatever matches you. And you can see that actually happening. If you go to the matrix tab, you've got revenue earned here. But then if we look at cash collected, here's that 10% up front. And how many jobs do we have? We have two. Let's just put this to one so you can really see what I'm talking about. So you've got, you should have uh, 250,000 collected up front on that first job. So there's that. And then here's that cohort of month one. Now we go to month 20 and you collect the rest there. So that dynamic happens completely. Um, uh, and it happened based on the amount of jobs started per month and all this. So it's really cool. I, I'm really happy with how that turned out. It makes sense. Uh, it's tough to build this if you've never done it. And Excel can do this. Um, it, it's, it's really good at it. So that's how we're driving uh, this row. And then the rest of this is pretty simple. Just non-current assets, accumulated depreciation, total assets. Um, liabilities if you have any debt and then um, that's based on the debt schedule here um, and then invested capital is just your equity and then you've got retained earnings 
total owner's equity, and then liabilities plus equity equal assets. So this is your check for that, and that will equal all the way across. And all these numbers will update depending on how you structure your assumptions in all the yellow tabs. Balance sheet annual, same deal, but on an annual basis. Uh, here's a check, and some are double zero, some are negative, or just a dash, and that's because um, Excel does do some rounding. So, like, if you were to expand this out to like ten decimals, there's yeah, there's like a six there. So that's just a rounding thing. That's why it's not a complete zero, but by all intents and purposes, it's a, it's a good check as long as it's two zeros. Uh, cash flow. So this is where you can see all of your different activities that are affecting cash. So customer receipts, then you're reducing that earned revenue back out. You're increasing cash by the actual cash received, reducing OPEX. You've got interest, you got taxes. Here's the net effect of that. Um, CapEx, sale of business, sale of depreciable assets. That'll happen here in the end month. Um, and then for uh, finance activities, we got debt, principal, and stock. And then this cash amount is what's driving the balance sheet cash flow here. And then again, that all balances. We got some visuals. So annual revenue, annual revenue by job type, stack column, annual EBITDA, annual cash flow. Uh, monthly. I, I did put the monthly receivables and recognized revenue um, from the balance sheet in a chart because I think that's interesting to see over time what that is and if it's positive or negative and what the stabilized amount is. Uh, monthly cash flow. Annual gross margin, which is just revenue less construction costs. Annual construction costs by job type, stack column each year. And I also did annual revenue and annual construction costs by job type side by side. So you can see the total amount for each without being in a stacked uh, column as well. And then this is just showing the ongoing month end jobs by job type, which says uh, any given month, uh, this is how many jobs are expected to be ongoing meaning they're not completed yet. And the way I calculated that is if we go over, I believe we did this at the bottom. Yeah. So here I did percentage of each job completed. And then this algorithm just checks if it's, if it's at 100% or 0%. And it only um, puts a number in, the number, the job count of uh, jobs started in the given monthly cohort if you're greater than 0% but less than 100. And then if you aggregate that, you can see the total jobs that exist at any one point. And that's done for job type one, two, and three. And if you didn't know, matrix one is job type one, matrix two is job type two, matrix three is job type three. So we can put that up here actually, just so you can see it. Um, Okay, executive summary is a high roll up of all the revenue items, operating costs, EBITDA, cash flow, all the other cash flow items here, and that is checked against the uh, ending cash balance to make sure it's right. And you've got some returns here IRR um, for the project as a whole and for the investors and owners, depending on how that's broken down. This is a discounted cash flow analysis. So here you can apply a discount rate and see a net present value of the project. And the investors and owners can also do the same. And, and again, this is the total project cash flows and then how that's split accordingly. And that's all, the splits are all driven based on the cap table numbers entered here. Okay, uh, monthly details. So this is where you actually see how all these assumptions are flowing over time for each job type. Um, we've broken it down to revenues, cash collected, uh, material cost paid, equipment, wages, payroll by each job type. Then you've got your overall operating costs here. Um, and then other debt service and other cash flow items here. Annual details, same deal, but on an annual basis. And that's the full financial simulation you got. So if you're looking at um, either you've got a construction business and you want to tighten up the accounting or the uh, margins and you want to really analyze your jobs and, and adjust some things, you can do that. Or if you're just starting up and you need a cash flow forecast, 
Uh, this is a really great tool that will work for any construction business um, at a fairly high level. Um, I mean, we do have three job types, uh, but yeah, it, it'll give you a nice cash flow forecast um, and financial statements to start thinking about the economics of the endeavor and what makes sense and what doesn't. The model you can buy in the link in the description box below. Um, it'll be listed on the industry specific bundle on smarthelping.com as well as other vendor sites. And don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and uh, let me know what you want to see next. Alrighty, see you on the next one.